Republican Senator Rand Paul says that 15 federal agencies knew all along that scientists in Wuhan had tried to create a virus that would have looked a lot like COVID-19. In an op-ed titled The Great COVID Cover-Up, Shocking Truth About Wuhan and 15 Federal Agencies, published at Fox News Digital on Tuesday, Paul writes, For years, I have been fighting to obtain records from dozens of federal agencies relating to the origins of COVID-19 and the Diffuse Project. Under duress, the administration finally released documents that show that the Diffuse Project was pitched to at least 15 agencies in January 2018. To elaborate on this bombshell, what he's calling a smoking gun, is Senator Paul himself. Senator, welcome back to Rising. Thanks for having me. Great to speak with you. So we've known, of course, that EcoHealth Alliance had pitched the Diffuse project to, I believe, the Defense Department did not procure funding for that project, although, you know, whether that research was going on or had gone on anyway or continued is an open question. But now you're saying that it's, it's f far from this lone agency that knew about this project. Who else in the government knew that scientists were trying to get government funding to make a virus that would have looked like COVID? And it's important to know that we only know anything about this because of a whistleblower. So in 2021, a Lieutenant Colonel Marine, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Joseph uh, Murphy at DARPA came forward and he said he'd been looking for research like this because he was convinced that it was going on. He went to a folder, a computer folder, and he looked for this and it wasn't there. Then he saw another exchange between myself and Fauci, and he saw the tension heating up, and he went back to the folder and he looked, and all of a sudden, the document was there. And the document indicated that Wuhan Lab was working with UNC, Ralph Barrick, and with Peter Dayzak at EcoHealth, and that a proposal was to take a coronavirus, which is not very infectious in humans usually, and make it more infectious in humans by putting a special cleavage site called the furin cleavage site in. Well, DARPA passed on this. DARPA said, well, damn, that sounds uh, a little bit crazy to create a virus that could be so contagious because coronavirus can be deadly, but it's typically not very contagious. Now you're going to combine, combine deadly with contagious. You got a real problem. And so they turned it down. And so we always said when 2020 happened and we saw the sequence of COVID-19, alarm bells should have gone off in DARPA and they should have come forward and warned us that Wuhan had already proposed to create a very similar type of virus. And no one did, no one from DARPA came forward. So we've always faulted the people at DARPA and think they were covering it up other than the whistleblower. But now we know the presentation for this research was given to 15 agencies, including the NIH, and the, NAI, the NIAID, which is Fauci's division of NIH. And worse than that, not only were they briefed, the original diffuse proposal we now know included work to be done at the Rocky Mountain Lab in Colorado that's owned by Fauci's division of the NIH. So it, it, it doesn't pass the credulity test that somehow Anthony Fauci knows nothing of this. So we've actually... Uh, come up with another criminal referral for him because in committee and help committee, he tells Senator Roger Marshall that he knows nothing of this diffuse grant. And also in Missouri versus Biden, the court case in deposition, he says he knew nothing of this uh, diffuse grant. And yet now we know his agency was briefed and his agency was gonna be part of the original proposal. How might this have changed matters in the early, during the early outbreak as conversations were beginning about where this could have come from? How might those conversations have been different had these agencies who knew scientists had sought to do research that could have led to COVID, how m might that have been relevant during this discussion when the scientists very quickly, you know, convalesced around the idea that no, it, it could not have, that's what they said in that, in that article, it, the proximal origins paper, it could not have come from a lab. So most scientists who follow both the science of virology and the public policy, like Robert Redfield, he was head of the CDC, he's a virologist, he's been involved all the way back to the time of uh, AIDS's origin. He's been involved in a lot of this discussion. He says that the one thing about animal viruses that's different than laboratory viruses is that animal viruses are very much adapted for animals, makes sense. When they attack a human or they accidentally infect a human, they're usually not very infectious because they've been uh, naturally selected to be good at reproducing in the animal. 
So they have to keep trying. They have several different forays into humans, and then by the luck of chance or nature, a mutation happens, they infect a human, and then all of a sudden it's more contagious. But this process takes a while, and they, they describe it as a that the virus is clunky and not very good. So SARS-1 was a virus, a coronavirus, that led to an epidemic in 2003. It had a 10% mortality. That's why we were very worried with this pandemic, but it didn't, wasn't very infectious. Only about 8,000 people caught it. And because you could quarantine people because it wasn't going very fast, people would not go out and they'd stay at home while they were sick. And it pretty much, they were able to stop it through traditional quarantine. This one was different from the very beginning. This coronavirus was wildly transmissible and got more transmissible over time, but was wildly transmissible from the very beginning. And so the way you treat this from a public health point of view, if it's an animal virus, you're thinking 2003 SARS-1, this isn't going to be that bad. You know, that's why I think, you know, you heard Fauci early on, like in January and February, there's a couple of quotes from him where he says, it's not that serious. It looks, you know, most of these things kind of peter out. That would be true if it were animal. But with all the evidence of it coming from the lab, they would have been much alarmed more quickly and maybe our testing, maybe our quarantine, maybe our you know uh, travel, maybe we would have uh, been able to advise some things earlier on. But the bottom line is the, the real malfeasance here is that the cover up is to obscure the connection between US dollars flowing to Wuhan lab and then the ultimate culpability, or at least a share in the culpability by Anthony Fauci because he approved this money going to a lab that was either sloppy or had an accident, but ultimately it created this, this pandemic. You would think some of these federal agencies would feel a little bit of contempt or would want accountability from the people at, for instance, EcoHealth Alliance, whom we now know, this came from uh, U.S. Right to Know, that the proposal, the Diffuse Project, privately the scientists uh, admitted that they were trying to mislead the government about where the research would be done because they knew if they, while they intended to do a lot of the research in Wuhan, China, they knew if they told the government that, that would raise red flags because the safety standards standards there are more lax. Why aren't our, uh, you know, public health accountability agencies um, very frustrated that they were misled by these scientists? It boggles the mind because typically people from the left really see a big role for government in safety and malfeasance. If this were a, a private company making baby formula, they would have shut it down <laughs> and you know people would have gone to jail. Seriously, if it were a private company doing this, but it happens to be government. And I think that their love of government and central planning causes them to defend irrationally, to defend things even when they're grossly mismanaged or when there's gross negligence or even lying and malfeasance, they defend it to the end. I mean, Anthony Fauci has been given million dollar awards by left wing groups, million dollar awards. He still has a limo and security service 24 hours 24 seven, even though he's supposedly retired. So, I mean, the love goes on and I think it's really the love for central planning and they see the attack on Fauci or anything that went wrong as an attack on centralized authority. And it should be, I mean, this is an argument for individual uh, healthcare decisions being made by individuals for people being able to assess their own risk and benefit. And there's, there's a place for advice. You know, uh, there are things I would have said if I if I had been uh, the public health official early on in the pandemic, there are two things uh, that I would have recommended that might have saved lives. Uh, one of them would be to protect the elderly by having the people who take care of them be people who have already recovered from COVID, using natural immunity to try to protect. And it wouldn't be perfect, but it would be better than nothing, particularly when there was no vaccine. But then the other thing is trying to target things like the vaccine to people who are at most risk. You know, we had, I can remember early on, we, we were uh, in favor of it for my in-laws. And uh, we'd see, you know, nothing against firemen or policemen, but we'd see these 22-year-old policemen getting it. They were, you know, uh, healthy and very fit. And it's like, really, I think the 90-year-olds should probably get it before the firemen and the policemen. Because it mm. turned out the disease wasn't very deadly for young people. And most of them shrugged it off. And actually, the more young people getting it quickly and surviving it helps to develop more of the community immunity that you ultimately need to fight this thing. What would be appropriate accountability for some of these government officials um, if, if there was, in fact, a cover-up and if we do, in fact, find that research we funded, obviously it's not been demonstrated yet, but we have a lot of, uh, a lot of scrutiny and a lot of questioning to do about where COVID came from. What is the proper accountability for government officials 
like Dr. Fauci, who, you know, obviously I don't think he should be getting death threats or any of those kinds of, you know, crazy people coming after him, but should there be a, a, accountability in terms of the legal process if it does, if it can be proven to be the case that COVID came from a lab, or even, frankly, even if it didn't, that this research was risky or was done in an improper, illegal way and, and ought to have been a warning sign when COVID happened? You know, I think accountability is important. I think it's even more important that we not let this happen again. But as far as the accountability, it's a felony to lie to Congress. And there have been people from the Trump administration that have been, you know, arrested in handcuffs in their underwear by 17 agents in the morning. I mean, they went after Trump people. So I think the same justice, we should have the same justice regardless of who you are, what your party is. I don't uh, have any kind of uh, hope that the Biden administration will prosecute uh, Fauci. So even though I send criminal referrals because I think he broke the law, and if we had an attorney general who was doing their job, I think he would be prosecuted. I don't think it will happen. As far as the people that didn't reveal things, if they've lied, you know, there needs to be repercussions. So for example, we know one of uh, Fauci's lieutenants, David Morins, was using his private email. We know because he bragged to other people, don't send me any information uh, on my government email, send it to me on my Gmail. He bragged about breaking the law. Um, we can't even find out whether they fired him. We think he's on administrative leave. What does that mean? He's been on paid vacation for a year. He doesn't have to work, but he's still paid for doing something that was wrong for malfeasance. You should be paid. I mean, you should be fired, not paid. And uh, we can't even get that information. It, it is easier probably to get to the secrets of the hydrogen bomb, you know, or nuclear fission or nuclear fusion than it is to get documents from the NIH. They've been completely uncooperative, uncooperative and have never given us anything. And so there's, it's probably going to take a new administration. But I've talked to, you know, uh, Becerra, the secretary Becerra, who's head of HHS that oversees NIH. And I've talked to him on the phone with the Democrat chairman of Homeland Security. We have come together, both parties asking for this information, and they stiff arm us. They just won't give it to us. And none of this is classified. It's like we want to see the deliberations over who determined that this research was safe, who determined that it was okay to fund it, and how the discussion go. Because if you want to fix this, we need to know what went wrong because they made a mistake. None of them are willing to even admit they made a mistake in funding this research. And the research isn't really related to an administration. Some of this research that we have wind of is 2015, 2016. But even by that time, there was a pause. The federal government wasn't supposed to be funding this research, and there were exemptions granted. Anthony Fauci was granting exemptions. And so we really have to get to the bottom of this to fix it. And we can't just say, oh, nothing ever happened, and it didn't come to the lab, and expect that we're going to be protected from this happening again. Senator Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.